Welcome to the CEC report. It's the 20th of June. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined with CEC organiser Glenn Isherwood. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC report, censoring Glass-Steagall banking solution backfires and Britain's client state, Saudi Arabia, funding the ISIS jihadists. When is the world going to fight the cause of terrorism? So first... Censoring Glass-Steagall banking solution backfires. Glenn's joining me on the CEC report today because Glenn got to attend the Australian Local Government Association's National General Assembly in Canberra That's right. at the start of the week, right, Glenn? And, of course, for those who've been watching the show regularly, this, this was um, an important thing for us to be at because there'd been a big push to have a, a, a motion put up for debate at this assembly uh, to debate um, opposing the bail-in law, which would steal bank deposits like in Cyprus to prop up failed banks, and supporting Glass-Steagall instead, or a, a, a banking separation instead. And of course, Glenn, that um, motion was blocked by the executive of the Australian Local Government Association. Um, so. Before I come to you on that, Glenn's going to give us a, a first-hand account of what went on at this conference. But there's a very um, ironic factor that's come in now because by blocking this motion, all ALGA achieved was to get it more publicity and probably more support than if it had been debated. Yeah. Right? So I want to, just want to highlight some of it. We had, for example, the Newcastle Herald, now that you know, Newcastle is a local government that lost a lot of money on the um, CDOs of Lehman Brothers. Right? Yeah, it was one of the top five uh, councils in New South Wales that lost millions on CDOs. Yeah, and it, and and that's lawful because it's also a bigger council. So, Greg, the yeah, there was a, a um, last Thursday there was an article in the a column in the Newcastle Herald. Greg Ray, don't bank on next time, and Greg Ray writes this column around the fact that big Global bankers like Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan are saying, oh, well, too big to fail is not a problem now. But, uh, you know, any bank that gets in trouble will be allowed to fail on its own. And um, we know that's rubbish, but Greg Ray tackled it in his own way. He says, so in the wonderful new world of the financial future, where too big to fail won't be an excuse anymore to load your gambling losses onto governments, who will pay? I don't know. But I know people who think they do. The Citizens Electoral Council, for example, is certain that the new plan will involve bailing in failed banks, partly by seizing funds of unsecured creditors, as happens in other insolvencies. Ho-hum, how boring, I hear you say. Would you find it boring if it turned out that depositors were classed as unsecured creditors? Didn't think so, because that would mean that a bank, having gambled with your money and lost, might then only return you whatever proportion of cents in the dollar seemed appropriate on the day. They did it to large deposit holders in Cyprus, as the CEC loves to point out. And then Greg mentioned that he'd called the Australian Local Government Association um, about why they're not debating the bill. He says, but the Local Government Association has prevented the motion from being debated. I asked the association why it wouldn't let its members discuss the topic. It didn't meet the necessary criteria to make it onto the agenda, I was told and it wasn't pertinent to the core business of local government. It might be if a bail-in ever happens. And that's the conclusion of Greg Ray's article in the Newcastle Herald. Yeah, and that, at that point, it'll be too late, Robbie, because exactly. you have no ability to stop a bail-in once, it, You're not once get the it back. bank fails. No, exactly. And uh, one of the facts about Cyprus was it wasn't just individual depositors who uh, had their bank accounts frozen and their money taken. It was also churches, charities and councils. And uh, the consequences of that is it, it, the entire economy came to a screeching halt. And, um, you know, the, the effects are still being felt to this day. Yeah. Well, what, 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 what people have to understand on that, which is a good point, we, we get asked a lot, Glenn, what sort of accounts get bailed in, etc. No, it's just that they take, when, when a bank is insolvent, it's because its liabilities are greater than its assets, right? And so they take the liabilities, which includes those to unsecured creditors, including depositors, and they say, we need to shave this by this, um, by this percentage to get it below the assets again so we can pretend we're solvent. And whatever percentage they define, that comes off the top of every bank account. 
right? And in Cyprus, it's nicknamed the haircut, but it's more like a decapitation, of course. Um, all right, so that was the Newcastle Herald. The Financial Review, the Australian Financial Review, got very interested in this story, and um, AFR journal James Ayres covered it, and he it was particularly relevant in the context of the federal court decision we talked about last week, which upheld the, the earlier ruling against ABN MRO and Standard & Poor's, and said Standard & Poor's was knowingly deceptive in rating these products that councils invested in that cost them millions of dollars, rating them AAA. Knowingly deceptive, and of course that has big consequences, that ruling worldwide. So um, uh, the fact, therefore, the, the Financial Review thought it strange that the Australian Local Government Association would therefore block a debate on a motion that directly related to something that had cost councils so much money. And then the same, the same um, reporter in the Financial Review ran a full page um, article, a col he did a column on the question of I'll just hold that up there. Too big to fail and bail-in in general. Shots fired at too big to fail for. And he highlighted in there that the Treasury, the Australian Treasury, in its, recommend, in its submission to the financial system inquiry that is going on at the moment, the Australian Treasury effectively recommended bail-in. This is the way he put it. For example, the G20 is formulating a bail-in regime for globally systemically important banks. Bail-in involves the government writing down the value of bank debt or converting debt into equity when the bank fails so shareholders and bondholders, brackets, and potentially depositors, rather than taxpayers, suffer the pain of failure. And then a quote from the Treasury, quote, in theory, a credible bail-in regime would directly address the moral hazard and efficiency issues caused by too big to fail. Whether the market would ensure appropriate discipline in practice is a matter yet to be tested, end quote, Treasury said in its submission to the financial system inquiry. So we're getting deeper into this, Glenn, um, in a way. Now, we, we first started highlighting bail-in in Australia a, over a year ago, well, when it happened in, in March, because remember we had a, um, a source who informed us after the March bail-in that they, he knew that APRA was talking about it here in Australia, all right? So we've been highlighting that. Now a year later, you're starting to get very serious media reporting on it. And in an ironic way, it's because partly it was fed by ALGA making this incredibly stupid decision to block a debate on this motion. Um, yeah, which backfired on them because the independent thinking councillors at this event were even more uh, concerned and intrigued in discussing it with us uh, yeah. while we attended. And um, just on the point of the bail-in, uh, back in March, uh, we, the CEC, invited the former Japanese Ministry of Finance uh, uh, key figure Daisuke Kotagawa to Australia to meet with members of parliament and what he defined is there's two choices before the world right now. We either accept too big to fail banks, which is bail-in, yep. accepting the status quo, which means these banks are going to be too large, which means everyone's money will be used to prop them up in, in case of failure, or it's going to be a choice of Glass-Steagall, which is a breaking up of those institutions, making sure they're smaller, manageable, and boring, and, boring, that, yeah. and they're not risking um, everyday people's deposits on speculation investments in risky activity. Yep. So, I mean, there is, a, there is a huge amount of people around the world from all uh, financial sectors, economic sectors, and former political uh, leaders of countries who have advocated for Glass-Steagall. So the, the only people that don't want to see this happen are the bankers and Rupert Murdoch, who's not allowing the discussion in our media in Australia. No, that's true. So listen, why don't we take a break? When we come back, you can give us some inside account, eyewitness account of what happened at the Algo conference. Right. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report, where I'm joined with Glenn Ishwood to discuss the Australian Local Government Association's foolish decision to block a debate on the bail-in policy and the Glass-Steagall solution, which has backfired on them and given us a lot more publicity and a lot, a lot more scrutiny of this issue. Now, I want to ask Glenn to report for the viewers on what actually happened at this Alga General Assembly in Canberra this week. But before I do, I just want to um, make a point about... Uh, 
This local government association effectively said, look, this isn't relevant to us. And of course, the media said, well, crying out loud, you know, there's just been a court case about what you guys, the money you guys lost from bad investments that this Glass-Steagall issue was very relevant to. Well, let's just look at Glass, a couple of other aspects about Glass-Steagall. So um, starting this week, there's been an ad running on television, which people can, you, you can you'll see this ad. Where, this is by the customer-owned banking association in Australia, which represents the credit unions of Australia and building societies and that. And as you see, that shows the, these four institutions getting government money rained down on them, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they are the big four banks who are too big to fail. I mean, this, this ad kind of defines it, and it, it makes the point. They've done figures that show that the, the effective guarantee that these four big banks have that makes them too big to fail by the government, the effective guarantee is worth to them to a $2.5 billion subsidy each year. Now, these are banks that already make, this year they're on track to make $30 billion profit, right? So Glass-Steagall is specifically about that, as you enunciated before the break. Second thing is, as of the 16th of June, so four days ago, 162 organisations co-signed a letter in America to the US Congress asking US congressmen to co-sponsor the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act, which is an act of Congress that's in the Senate and it's in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, it's being pushed by Senator Elizabeth Warren, who's becoming more well-known. And Glenn, I noticed this week that our own Senator Christine Milne, dear Christine, decided Senator Warren was worth quoting in the Senate. Well, so I expect the Greens to come knocking on the door and find out more about Glass-Steagall, which is what Senator Warren is the most is most well known for endorsing. Yeah, uh, better late than never. Better late than never, which would be very good. Um, so this is to say it's not relevant is is worse than putting your it's not it's not putting your head in the sand. It's putting your head up, you know, where the sun don't shine, right? Anyway, so you went to this event, the Australian Local Government Association Conference General Assembly in Canberra in June. You're a brave man for doing that. Um, better you than me. I hope you enjoyed the weather. How did it go? So at the NGA, uh, this comes in the wake of the budget announcement by Joe Hockey. And the overwhelming issue of every council and every, almost every motion at this event is how do we get enough money to finance what council needs to do? You know, basic services, ba basic infrastructure. So th that alone says what we're talking about with them is relevant. Right. <laughs> and, and we came along with a specifically uh, worded flyer that touches on two issues. Why local councils need to demand a Glass-Steagall bank separation and a national bank to issue credit for you know, their needs. So we gave that out on Monday morning. And uh, the, the, I mean, the, the issue of this conference was funding. And uh, in the budget specifically, uh, one of the appropriations for councils is what's called the Financial Assistance Grant Scheme. Right. And this uh, has been uh, taken out. And uh, this is a major, major source of funding for uh, a lot of rural councillors. Uh, councils and uh, what this is this is the government backing of the local government which if they don't have this you know councils are, are forced into uh, taking ratepayer money and throwing it in the casino in investment banking like the very yep. CDOs that burnt them uh, the the role of councils is not to be a speculator or investment banker in in throwing their ratepayer money at a casino to to bait to provide these services. So, I mean, this created a very rich uh, and, and very uh, electrified atmosphere for what we were discussing. But what actually happened on the very first day, after we'd handed out 300 or so of these statements to the mayors and other delegates, the committee board of the, uh, uh, the NGA, the ALGA committee board, uh, had, in a sense, made a decree that no motions or uh, it would be allowed to be brought up from delegates to this conference that appear to come from community interest groups pushed upon councils or forced through councils. Which is us. Which was explicitly us, because we were the, the most visible presence there um, from, from the very beginning. And, I mean, one councillor reported to us that this had the effect of, in a sense, shining even a greater spotlight on the issues of Glass-Steagall and, I mean, out of this, uh, I mean, National uh, Chairwoman Ann Lawler and I 
uh, we were the only two there for, from CEC. I mean, in, in the course of the two days, we had more than 20 meetings, and many of those meetings had, you know, two or three uh, representatives from councils. And what their take, they took away with it from, from our discussions was a greater understanding of the nature of how derivatives are a predatory operation. Uh, derivatives are used to suck in um, the uneducated... Because hardly anyone really knows what derivatives are, do they? Right, and derivatives thrive in a market of volatility. Yep. They, they love uncertainty. And uh, so we were able to convey you know, how these were used to deceive councils. And then um, the other question, the questions was, what specifically is this bail-in? And uh, you know, how far along are we in Australia? So I mean, it, was, it was quite interesting because the very same day that uh, we were having these meetings, the Australian Financial Review had printed two articles, one confirming our Treasury is exploring bail-in, and the second, uh, highlighting the, the issue of councils losing millions in these CDOs. So, in a, in a sense, the, the committee was a bit out of touch with, with yep. what's actually uh, the, the dialogue going on. And um, coming away from this, as many of these councillors uh, said, well, I'm committed to, to you know, getting more motion on this and getting more uh, traction on this in my local region, and they're going to they're gonna take it away and work harder than before. To, to see that this, this uh, fight is taken to the next level. And Glenn, it bears mentioning that not, it wasn't in the, the, the motion that was suppressed or blocked, but when councillors signed onto the ad that we ran in the Australian um, in December, yeah. we talked about Bailey and Glass-Steagall and national banking, as you mentioned, that you had literature about. How did the councillors respond to this idea of national banking? Well, uh, many recall, you know, the the Com fact that when the Commonwealth Bank was uh, privatised and sold off, that, I mean, back then banks were manageable. I mean, one of the facts that many remember is that, you know, the private banks were kept in check by yep. the Commonwealth Bank. When that was taken away, you know, these ludicrous profits that they're posting every year, what I think you said, $30 billion, that is not, uh, that does not reflect the real economy of no. Australia. And that was, that was uh, something that uh, the council has mentioned to us. How can the banks be posting such large profits when um, everything around us is, is in a, a collapsed process, jobs yeah, well, being lost? And of course, the, it, it makes you wonder, and it's true, that those profits are as a result of helping cause that collapse. Right. But anyway, thanks very much, Glenn. That was a good report. Um, when we come back, we're going to change the subject now to what's happening in Iraq with this group called ISIS. Welcome back to the CEC report. Finally, Britain's client state, Saudi Arabia, funding ISIS jihadists. When is the world going to fight the cause of terrorism? So, Glenn and the viewers, you would have all seen um, it's a pretty dramatic situation that's erupted in Iraq um, at the moment with this group called ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or sometimes called ISIL, Iraq and the Levant, um, and they're running rampant and they've taken over a whole bunch of cities and a whole, you know, a big chunk of the northern end of Iraq and the northern part of Syria is, it, and it's not just, it's not just actually that apparently they've, they've conquered the cities. Um, thanks to their foothold in Syria anyway, they're, they're functioning as a kind of government already, right? And um, unfortunately, now, the news reports talked about there were 1,700 executions of Iraqi soldiers. That's probably um, propaganda, but there was at least 50 that did get executed in the way that people might have seen the um, Twitter photos about, etc. Um, they want to send this kind of message. This is a, a total destabilisation factor, and of course this, this, this particular group is a pretty nasty um, bunch. But you know, we ha what we want to do here is just put on the record some of the things that should have should be informing the debate all along, and they're kind of not because, as you mentioned on, in, the, in, in regard to economics, Murdoch dominates this debate, and Rupert Murdoch has blood in his hands for the Iraq War that helped get this whole thing started. So, here's the deal: this group is funded by Saudi Arabia and also Qatar, but we're going to um, that whole Emirates part of the Arabian Peninsula is a pretty bad scene. But the Saudis that are key 
because of course they are our allies. They're America's allies, they're Britain's allies. They're actually a British client state, the Saudis, right? Going back to the days of Lawrence of Arabia, that's how it's set up. And when the Saudi king goes to England, when the president of America goes to England, he stays in a hotel. When the Prime Minister of Australia goes there, he stays in a hotel. When the King of Saudi Arabia goes to England, he stays in Buckingham Palace. Yeah. Right? It's a, they're a very close... The Saudis have this very close relationship with the um, British. Tony Blair, he had the temerity to say this week that ISIS is taking over because the West did not intervene to topple Assad in Syria. When, of course... The same Saudis were funding the jihadis in Syria to topple Assad. It's what this ISIS group wants to topple Assad. If they hadn't, if the West hadn't backed the jihadis in Syria to weaken Assad, mm. it's arguable this ISIS group wouldn't have been able to take hold, you know, in uh, in Saudi in um, Syria at all. Consequently, it was it, it was um, poetic justice, though, because by opening his gob. Some British MPs have finally said, Tony Blair is a despised man in Britain. The world should know that. They hate him. Everyone knows he was a liar from what exactly. he said about Iraq war. So because he opened his gob, um, some British MPs have actually taken steps in the British Parliament this week to impeach him. Now, they can't remove him from office because he's not in office. They want to prosecute him for his war crimes. They want for the lies, um, for warmongering in the first place, and for the corruption of his office. And um, what this bears out, though, is that the real cause of this, despite the denials, it was the 2003 war in Iraq, which was based on a lie. That's what unleashed this genie out of the bottle. And the, of all the lies associated with the war, the biggest one, though, is the one people know the least about, which is that when there was a... People knew they, they tried to make this tenuous connection between Iraq and 9-11. There never was a connection. That was, that was just a lie. But in the official US Congress's 9-11 report on 9-11, there's 28 pages that to this day remain classified. Everything else can be read except these 28 pages, right? And the go sen a former Senator, Bob Graham, who was on the commission that did this report, he's leading the charge to have these declassified because those 28 pages are about how the Saudis finance and have long financed global terrorism. Our allies are financing the terrorism. And of the, you know... The, they, they, whatever your view on 9-11 was, they, they identified 19 or so hijackers. 17 of them were Saudis, right? But of course, they're our lives and we haven't touched them. This goes back to, if people want more information, the CEC in 2007 published this new citizen, BAE scandal rocks British empire. What that goes through is the roots of this Saudi funding, which was a deal between a Saudi prince, Bandar bin Sultan, and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of Britain in the 80s, and it was called the Al Yamama Arms Deal, and it was where the Brits sold fighter jets to the Saudis, not for money, but for oil. And so tankers of oil were shipped to Britain in exchange that the Brits could use to sell on the open market and get the money. But that difference between what the oil cost the Saudis and what the Brits could sell it for was able to create a slush fund that began financing terrorism, including, and it was known at the time, Osama bin Laden. And Robbie, look, this, the British in this part of the world, the British Empire, have always used uh, conflicts. They would love this region to be broken up into small, dysfunctional yep. states. That goes back to Sykes-Picot and, and many other things, and that is the agenda today. Yep. So, people, you need to... Um, brush up on the history of this, so look this up material up on our internet. Get our Australian Alert Service and tune in for next week for more of the CEC report.